May I ask our committee secretary to recognize our guest? Our, I mean, we, first of all, I would like to acknowledge the presence of the following senators: uh, Senator uh, Senator Gachalian, uh, Senator Win Gachalian, and online is Senator Sunny Angara and Senator Amy Marcos. We would like. I'd like to acknowledge their presence and may I ask our committee secretary to recognize our guests that are both physically and virtually present. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair. The guests, our resource persons that are present are the following. From the BSP, um, Attorney Elmore O. Capule, Senior Assistant Governor, Office of the General Counsel and Legal Services, physically present. Mr. Melchor T. Plaba, San, Director, Technology Risk and Innovation Supervision Department of the BSP, physically present. Ms. Richie Sugitan, Deputy Director, Supervisory Policy and Research Development from the BSP. And Attorney Joseph B. Salud, Legal Officer, Office of the General Counsel and Legal Services from the BSP, physically present. From the BSP as well, the following are virtually present. Deputy Governor Chuchi Fonacher, Financial Supervi Supervision Sector. Deputy Director Rochelle D. Tomas, Consumer Protection and Market Conduct Office. And Ms. Annalisa R. Racines, Bank Officer 5, Payment System Oversight Department. From the, B from the SEC, of uh, virtually present is SEC Chairman Attorney Emilio Benito Aquino and Mr. Paolo Ong. Uh, SEC contingent will also be physically present. Uh, they, will, they are just getting their, uh, the results of their antigen tests. From the... From the DICT, physically present, we have Yusek David Almirol um, and Yusek Paolo Mercado. We also have virtually present uh, Mr. Kenneth Stern, General Manager for the Philippines of Binance, Mr. Yong Fung, APAC Director of Binance, and Ms. Sonia Mabubani, Binance Regulatory Council. All of these are virtually present. We ha also have Attorney Ryan Oi, lawyer and cryptocurrency enthusiast from the Attorney, law Attorney Oi Law Office, who is virtually present. From the Cagayan Economic Zone Authority, CESA, we have Attorney Mike Gerald C. David, Chief Fintech and Cryptocurrency Officer. He is virtually present. He is uh, accompanied by Ms. Elish Kate B. Kakatian, Enterprise Supervise, uh, Services Officer 2, Enterprise Assistance Division, Fintech and Virtual Currency Department, also virtually present. From Fintech Alliance, we have the Chairman, Mr. Lito Villanueva, virtually present, and his Board of Trustee, Ms. Ida Tiongson, mm -hmm. from Fintech Alliance as well, virtually present. That's all, Your Honor. Since we have four members present, we have a quorum. In accordance with resolution number eight, amending rule 10, section 13 of the rules of the Senate, the Committee on Banks, Financial Institution, Institutions and Currencies shall have jurisdiction over all matters relating to banks, financial institutions, government and private currencies, capital markets, mutual funds, securitization, coinage, and circulation of money. The following senators are the members of the Committee on Banks, Financial Institutions, and Currencies. Senator Sherwin Wynn Gachalian, Vice Chairperson. Senator Juan Edgardo Sani Angara, Vice, Cha Vice Chairperson. Senator Cynthia Villar, Senator Amy Marcos, Senator Alan Peter Compañero Cayetano, Senator Grace Poe, Senator Manuel Lito Lapid, Senator Joseph Victor J.V. Ejercito, Senator Risa Ontiveros, uh, ex official member Senator Lauren Legarda, ex official member Senator Joel Villanueva, and ex official member Senator Aquilino Coco Pimentel, the third. The committee is adopting the rules of the Senate and the rules of the 
procedure governing inquiries in aid of legislation as its rules in the conduct of meetings, hearings, and investigations of the committee. May I ask one of our colleagues to make the proper motion? Thank you. He moved to approve the rules, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, the, the, there be, uh, any objections? The, uh, there being none, uh, the motion is approved. At this point in our organization meeting, we would like to call representatives of the PSP and SEC to brief the committee members and the public on the state of the Philippine banking industry and the financial sector, as well as their legislative agenda. Thank you. Uh, oops. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So <clears throat> we'll start with the briefing on the updates on the Philippine banking system to be conducted by Deputy Director Richie Segitan of our financial supervision sector. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to the Honorable Senators, Chairperson uh, Mark A. Billiar, fellow uh, from the Senate Committee on Banks, Financial Institutions and Currencies, as well as fellow uh, officers from the government agencies. Yeah. Thank you for inviting the BSP to present or provide an update on the Philippine banking sector. May I request the secretary to, yes, thank you. So for this morning, I'll be providing an update on the Philippine banking sector. Next slide, please, yes. For this morning's presentation, I'll be covering four key areas. These are the snapshot of the Philippine banking system the key regulatory relief measures, including the outlook of the banking for the, the next two years, as well as uh, recap my uh, presentation with the key take takeaways. So next slide, please. Uh, before we continue, I'd just like to acknowledge the, presidents, the presence of uh, Senator Coco Pimentel. Please continue. Okay. To continue on the banking... Uh, system performance that continue to support the economic growth. Uh, the Philippine banking system remains uh, the core of the Philippine financial systems. Banks uh, play a significant role in mobilizing savings and facilitating investment and growth. As of end June 2022, banks represented majority of the financial system at around 82.0% uh, of the total resources of the financial system. So amid the challenges posed by this uh, crisis, the COVID-19, the Philippine banks were able to provide financial services on account of their strength and stability as shown by sustained growth in its assets, loans and deposits supported by ample capital and liquidity as well as loan loss reserves. So as shown in the slide, the total assets of the banks grew by 7.8% year on year to 21 trillion as of end June 2022. These assets were funded mainly by deposits, which grew 7.5% to 16.5 trillion as of the same reference period. The growth in the assets and deposits were actually uh, uh, a testament of the bank's continued uh, trust and confidence of the banking sector, uh, of the banking public, to the banking sector. These deposits are actually mostly peso denominated and sourced from the domestic household and enterprises. So the assets of the banks are actually mostly comprised of loans and investment. Fifty-three percent are uh, from loans, and then twenty around twenty-eight percent from investments. Amid the opening of the economy, the lending actually uh, recovered as well and showed signs of recovery. The banking system loans uh, further expanded by 8.7% to 11 trillion. As of end June 2022, this actually marks the 11th consecutive month of growth since August 2021. Sectors that actually benefited the most from the loans extended by banks uh, as of end June 2021 were from the real estate, wholesale and retail trade, manufacturing and electricity, gas team and air conditioning supply sectors. Collectively, the sectors accounted for about 49.6% of the total loan portfolios of the banks. 
Meanwhile, loans for household consumptions or for the individual consumptions uh, was around 10.5% as of the same reference period. So the improvement in the key financial indicators of the banking system is actually accompanied by leaner and stronger banking network. As of end July 2022 preliminary data, there were actually 498 banks and 12,693 other offices. These include branch and branch light units. So next slide, please. So to con continue with the easing of the community restrictions and resumption of business operations, loan expansion is accompanied by improved loan quality. As shown uh, on the first uh, graph, uh, sorry, on the first image, guided by the prudential regulations of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, banks in the country have enhanced their lending standards with the adoption of sound credit risk management long before the COVID-19 pandemic. As such, banks were able to keep their non-performing loan ratio to single digit even during the crisis. As of end June 2022, the bank's non-performing loan ratio uh, stood at 3.6%. This is relatively better than the 4.5% ratio a year ago. Banks actually have adequate reserves buffer to cover for the estimated credit losses with an NPL coverage of around 97.1%. This is also higher than the 82% from a year ago and the 92.6% in December 2019. Uh, this only means that banks have charged losses amounting to 97% of their non-performing loans against their capital. So even with this move, bank were able to maintain their capital adequacy, adequacy ratio of around 16.5% as of end March 2022. This is well above the BSV's 10% minimum regulatory requirement and the 8% global standard. So banks' capital was mainly composed of stable capital such as common equity and retained earning. This, this, this denotes also that banks have room to expand lending and investment in line with the recovery of the economy. So uh, to continue, in terms of the liquidity position of banks, they remain more than uh, uh, adequate to actually provide so, uh, continued support to the economy with uh, a high liquidity coverage ratio of around 195.7% as of end May 2022. This also points to banks' adequate liquidity assets to withstand a 30-day liquid stress period. So similarly, the net stable funding ratio of the uh, banking system stood at around 141% as of end April 2022. This also suggests that banks have ample or stable funding to support their lending and investing activities. Uh, moreover, banks continue to be profitable even during the crisis. For the period June 2022, net profit increased by 16.7% to 143 billion, although this is let relatively lower than the 43% growth recorded in the same period. This is acceptable or uh, 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 expected because of the ongoing uh, crisis. Other measures like the return on assets, which uh, provide or uh, measures the cap capability of banks to generate profits using their assets and the return on equity or the measure or ability of the bank to generate income from the available equity or capital indicates sustained profit profitability of the banks. As of uh, for the period June 2022, both the return on assets and re return on equity actually increased to 1.2% and 9.6% re respectively, higher than the 1% and almost 8% posted a year ago. So next slide, please. So this pandemic as well, uh, the Banco Central ng Pilipinas uh, continued to support the economy as well as our bank, uh, BSP supervised financial institutions. So we remain active and proactive as well as adopted prudential and opera operational relief measures to assist our supervised financial institutions to mitigate the impact of the pandemic on their operations as well as provide equivalent relief to the 
banking sector, including the businesses which are uh, hardly hit by the COVID-19 crisis. So this financial relief measures actually remain in place until end December 2022 to continue to support the transition of the economy towards post-COVID-19 recovery. So they were given regulatory uh, reliefs to enable them to grant equivalent financial uh, relief to their borrowers in the form of more flexible and favorable uh, lending terms or to restructure loan accounts, among others. Uh, the financial reliefs may uh, be granted by these financial uh, institutions to their clients uh, based on their assessment or their sound credit risk management system. And also given the critical role of the businesses, which include the micro, small, and medium enterprises, uh, on economic recovery, the BSP's prudential measures are aimed at incentivizing bank to lend and assist this sector, including large enterprises who are critically impacted by the pandemic to carry on with their business and hasten the recovery and sustainability of their operations. So this includes time-bound measures to encourage lending in general by easing certain prudential and regulatory requirements of the banks. In terms of promotion of continued access to the financial services, policies were put in place to ensure access of deeply affected retail clients to formal financing channels. The use of information technology or IT in carrying out financial transactions was highly encouraged during this pandemic. This includes the relaxation of the KYC or the know your customer in onboarding requirements for its client. In terms of supporting for continued financial services delivery, the BSP also granted operational relief measures to assist uh, our supervised financial institution in focusing their limited resources on the delivery of financial services and support, their subsequent recovery efforts, usually in the form of relaxation of repertorial accounting, including notification requirements that uh, are regularly submitted by banks to BSP. As to the impact of the BSP's relief measures, uh, these have prompted banks to continue to grant new loans and provide financial reliefs to the borrowers. It is noteworthy that the total amount of new loans granted by Universal and Commercial Bank for the month of June actually grew by 22.2% uh, compared to last year. Most of the new loans uh, granted were to private corporations, followed by loans to individuals. And the number of new loan transactions has also been increasing during the pandemic based on the latest data. So next slide, please. Uh, this is the last two slides, uh, if I may. Uh, on the bank's uh, stable outlook of the domestic banking system, this slide actually show that uh, the banking industry remained optimistic and uh, estimate that over the next two years, stable bank outlook. So in particular, the banking sector outlook survey for the second semester of 2021 provides the sentiments of the president, chief executive officers, as well as country managers of banks in the country for the next uh, two years or the 2022 to 2023. The survey results show that majority of respondent expects growth in real GDP to improve to above 6%. Banks also continue to view the Philippine banking system as stable with prospect of double digit growth in assets, deposits, uh, loans, investments, and net income. In terms of the asset quality of banks, a lower number of respondent banks actually estimates a non-performing loan ratio of above percent, 5% in the next two years, but notably, Big banks or the large bank, the universal and commercial banks, estimate their NPL to settle within the range of greater than 2% to 3%, a shift from their projection of greater than 3% to 5% year in the previous year. And around half of these respondent banks, the universal and commercial banks, estimate that their NPL coverage ratio to remain above 100%. Among the top risks of the bank's operations, uh, the respondent uh, identified that asset quality and credit risk remain the topmost risk, while macroeconomic and operational risks are the risk common to most of the respondent banks. In line as well with the emerging market trends and evolving client needs, banks continued to recognize the importance of integrating technology in their operations to achieve business objective. 
Thus, Respondent Bank disclosed that they will continue and prioritize the digitalization of products and services for strategic efficiency, as well as prioritize the expansion of their target market in the next two years. Finally, banks also maintain or uh, intend to maintain capital and liquidity buffers at levels higher than the domestic and global standard to promote institutional stability. And for my last slide, uh, in closing, allow me to summarize, summarize the some key points from this presentation. So amid a sound and stable banking system, the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic okay. should not be seen as a hindrance to our continued and collective pursuit of sound, stable, resilient, sustainable, and inclusive domestic banking system. The key performance indicators of the banking system suggest sustained growth trajectory, underlining the inherent soundness and stability of the banking system as the core of the Philippine financial system. The President and Chief Executive Officers of Banks maintains a positive banking, uh, banking system outlook for the next two years, 2022 to 2023. And lastly, the BSP endeavors to foster a conducive regulatory environment through progressive reforms. The extension of effectivity of some of the BSP relief measures until end December 2022 reinforces the bank's lending activity and prudent credit risk management. It also aided in increasing the financial system risk-bearing capacity and its ability to expand their investment and lending activities. So with this, uh, we end the presentation, Your Honor. Thank you. Yes, at this point, um, we will continue with the presentations, uh, particularly the legislative agenda. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be presenting the BSP legislative agenda for this Congress. Okay. Actually, Mr. Chair, uh, last Congress was very productive for BSP. As a matter of fact, uh, practically, well, most of our legislative initiatives became law, like the Financial Consumer Protection Law, Amendment to PDIC Charter, and the Amendment to the Agri-Agra. Now, for this 19th Congress, uh, the BSP would like to focus on two priority measures. Next slide, please. Uh, we are looking at amendment to the Bank Deposit Secrecy Bill and a Financial Account Regulation Act. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Okay. So this is our two priority measures. Next slide. And we are also looking at two bills which we will support together with the national government the Digital Payments Bill, and the SIM Card Registration Bill. So our priority is really amending bank secrecy deposit, but on a very uh, limited scale. Next slide, please. Okay, next slide. Now, we all know that uh, uh, previously, under its old charter, the old central bank has the authority to look into deposits during the course of examination. But that was taken out when the new BSP charter was passed. Now, to date, uh, our country has the uh, distinction that we are the only country whereby the prudential regulator, meaning the central bank in the case of the Philippines, has no authority to look into bank deposits, considering that it is regulating banks. In all other countries, they have already amended their bank secrecy laws to allow their prudential regulators, the regulator of banks, to have access to bank deposits. Next slide, please. Such that uh, in the annual assessment of the World Bank and the IMF, uh, this is one of the things that they have consistently noticed. And as a matter of fact, uh, even under the Basel Core principles no, on effective bank supervision, by which we are supposed to comply by specific provision in our charter, uh, the effectiveness of a banking regulator requires that 
there has to be access by the regulator to bank deposits and other data. That's a international standard, Mr. Chair. Next slide. That's why in the last Congress, uh, uh, amendment to bank secrecy was even included in the legislative priority of the 18th Congress. Next slide. And uh, in the last Congress, uh, we had a broad industry-wide support whereby the Bankers Association of the Philippines, the Makati Business Club, uh, even the uh, Foreign Chamber of Commerce uh, came up with a, uh, as a letter, open letter to our legislators for the amendment of our bank uh, secrecy laws. Next slide. Okay, so that's why uh, the 17 business groups push for the amendment of the bank secrecy laws. So uh, in the last Congress, next slide, uh, BSP already crafted a bill which was first uh, filed in the lower house where it reached up to the second uh, reading. It was also filed in the Senate. Now, essentially, what we are looking at is a very, very limited uh, relaxation of bank secrecy laws. We are only looking at uh, deposit accounts of stockholders, owners, directors, trustees, officers, or employees of banks, as well as their agents or related party. Meaning, we are not opening bank secrecy. We are opening bank secrecy only on a very limited scale, meaning we do not want bankers to abuse their uh, power as bankers. We all know that banking is a fiduciary relationship because they hold other people's money, the deposits. Now, based on uh, our actual experience, uh, we have cases whereby the bankers themselves uh, borrow from their own bank or committed fraud and try to hide the proceeds of these funds or illicit funds in their very own bank, which the BSP cannot even look into. And that's very troubling because the bankers are supposed to protect the money of their depositors. And yet, because of this bank secrecy, we are allowing them to use that law to protect their illegal activity. So actually, it's a very, very limited opening up. Other than that, we are not opening up bank deposits. Now, there are also very stringent requirements which we are proposing that before BSP can open the account, it has to be a monetary board determination. That there are three grounds, no, very limited. There are uh, fraud, serious irregularity, and unlawful activity. Such being committed by these people such that it is necessary for the BSP to open up the bank account. So only the monetary board can issue an order, not ordinary examiner, not an ordinary staff. Only the monetary board will be the one to issue that order. And the information, the information will be limited only to the use of the BSP and for the criminal prosecution of these people. So the sharing is limited to uh, SEC, PDIC, AMLAC, DOJ, and the courts. So very, very limited uh, use of that information. It will also apply to foreign currency deposit. Next slide. Okay, so uh, we're also putting additional safeguards here that this authority cannot be abused. Otherwise, uh, if it will be used for persecution or harassment, then it's another uh, sanction against, let's say, the BSP officer who will use that authority in an abusive manner. So essentially, that's the, that is the uh, highlights of that law. It's very limited in scope and application. It's very strict, stringent, and only the monetary board can allow the opening and for limited use. And there are sanctions if that authority will be abused. So we hope that uh, with this very limited opening, uh, this, uh, this law might be passed, this Congress. Now, next slide, please. I have a question. When you say sanctions, do you mean uh, administrative or criminal sanctions? What kind of sanctions are you? Administrative and criminal sanctions against, uh, let's say, employees of the BSP who will abuse this authority, meaning if they will invent something to open up an account, 
and then it, it turns out that there is really no basis whatsoever, then they can be sanctioned as an additional deterrent to prevent abuse. It's actually very similar to what we have in the anti-money laundering law. That while Congress allowed the opening of bank deposits, if you, if you are in the AMLAC or other government agencies, you abuse that right without reason or with malice, you try to open an account, then there are sanctions against you. Under this law, mostly uh, it will um, it will uh, in, in, it will affect or it will it will be um, only for those officers of the bank. Uh, limit, it will be limited only to officers of the bank and uh, mem directors. You're saying there are cases of uh, there are some cases that uh, of these officers borrowing from the bank itself. And and uh, for personal use, is that is that one of the uh, instances that that this this uh, law would pertain to? Uh, the basics of banking is that the owners are not supposed to benefit because they are getting the funds from the public. Now we have very stringent rules on what we call dosri, no directors, officers, stockholders, and related interest borrowing. Now a lot of these owners or officers of the bank to go around that will create dummy accounts whereby they are really the borrower. And then uh, once we detect that, we cannot look into that account. It's black. And there are cases where they are taking money out of the bank and then parking it in bank accounts, which they own in the very same bank. And when, once that happens, because once money enters into a bank account, we cannot... We cannot... Uh, under their own name? They, they, can, they can take out a loan under their own name and deposit it to their own account? Is that... No, but what we encounter is abuse of that borrowing because we are very stringent. You can only borrow up to the extent of your deposits. But what they do is they overborrow or they use dummy accounts or their corporations to borrow using fictitious accounts. And we have quite a number of that because based on what we, have, we are seeing, actually, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, most of the banks that are being closed are due to insider abuse. That's the sad reality. Are there more cases of the use of fictitious borrowers or is it more they're borrowing themselves but the bank is uh, allowing them to borrow beyond what is provided for in the law? Actually, what they do usually is they create dummy accounts because if they borrow using their own name, they will hit a ceiling. So they use drivers or they use fictitious persons. Dossi, violation of dossi. That's the usual case because... That is the cheapest way to get funding, Mr. Chair. You borrow at a 1% interest deposit, and then you borrow that money. So they know that there is a ceiling. So if you have companies, you're a banker, you have big companies, it's very cheap to borrow from your own bank, but they will hit the ceiling. So that's one of the cases where we encounter a lot of fraud. Those three, fictitious loans, fictitious accounts, and they use the very same bank and they hide the funds in their deposit in that bank. Even a fictitious uh, infusion of capital. They would try to make it appear that they are infusing capital, but in reality, that will come from another account, which they will return back after infusing capital. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So also, uh, complementary to this purpose, uh, we all know that the Philippines is in the gray list, and one of the uh, findings of the FATF is that there is no uh, effective implementation of the uh, money laundering law as well as other laws because of stringent bank secrecy. So they, they said that uh, one of our constraints is there is lack of ability of competent authorities to access information held by banks. So it's one of the things that we may be able to help address. While that's not the only issue by the FATF, if we can address also that point, then it will materially increase our chances of getting an early exit from the FATF, FATF uh, gray list. Okay, so essentially that's the first proposal of the BSP, a limited uh, amendment to bank secrecy law. So next slide, please. Okay, so next slide. Okay, now the other bill that uh, we would like to push for is what we call the Financial Accounts Regulation Act. 
Actually, this bill was uh, initiated by the Bankers Association of the Philippines and the BSP supported it. But essentially, we are looking at the same problem with the banks. No? We know that during these times, there are a lot of money mules or a lot of criminal activities, social engineering schemes, phishing, bishing, where they use accounts, either bank accounts or wallets, electronic wallets. Now, our problem here is that uh, there is insufficient legislation to deter this activity. So this law is actually very simple in the sense that if you use these accounts social, from social engineering or money mules from illegal activities, you will be penalized. If you allow the use of your account or you create accounts for this purpose, then that is criminalized. And we are also asking for authority for the BSP to apply for cybercrime warrants and to do the investigation of these kinds of uh, criminal activities. So it's actually a very, a very uh, limited law focusing on the illegal use of accounts during these times. So essentially, that's the uh, that's this uh, uh, financial accounts regulation act, Mr. Chair. Okay. So next slide. Now we st we have two laws which the BSP will support, but since these laws uh, are well, actually will emanate from the national government, we will just present this briefly that these are the two laws which the BSP will support together with the national government. The first one is, next slide, oh, yeah, that's, that's the Digital Payments Bill. Okay. Now, essentially, uh, the Digital Payments Bill will mandate the national government together with the local governments, all the government instrumentalities to go digital with respect to payments, collections of taxes, things like that. Now, there's an executive order issued by then-President Duterte before his term end whereby the government will adopt digital payments. While that is already very useful, uh, we believe together with the other government agencies that this should be hard-coded in a law because essentially it will require appropriation, budget, for the system, creation of the system. And because of the mandate of BSP on uh, digital payments, digital access, so we are going to support this bill. And lastly, uh, next slide, SIM card, the SIM card registration bill. Next slide, please. Now, we all know that uh, during these days, uh, a lot of accounts are being created, and these accounts or SIM cards using cell phones are used for fraud. No? Uh, you receive text messages saying that you won an award, things like that, or you click a certain link, but these are actually financial fraud using prepaid SIMs. Now, the best way to deter this type of criminal activity is really to have a system whereby SIM cards cannot be abused but should be registered. We are trying to deter financial crimes. And I mean, all of us here, I think, will receive on a daily basis a lot of these uh, notifications from SIM numbers. No, So what we will be supporting together with the national government is to revive this SIM card registration bill to deter cyber criminals. So essentially, those are the bills that the BSP will push and will support, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You mentioned earlier about the, the, the bill, the digital payments. Uh, I was just curious, at what, what is the, uh, do you have any idea or maybe some uh, statistics on how far along is government in implementing uh, digital payments uh, in our in our transactions. Well, you're aware. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, we have a resource person from PISOD. Uh, Attorney Bridget, can you answer the question of the chairman? How far along are we in digital payments? Uh, yes. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. We can hear you, Attorney Bridget. Go ahead. 
Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, and so far as uh, government digital payments, we're looking at it from both the collections and the disbursement side. So based on the um, measurement of um, for the year 2021, uh, the government disbursements are actually almost 97% digitalized already. However, with respect to collections, there are still opportunities for improvement as uh, payments from persons to the government is only at 8.2% digital, while payments from businesses to the government is 34.8% digital. And um, we expect that Executive Order Number 170, which was signed by President Duterte, um, on the adoption of digital payments among government for their disbursements and collections would help us further digitalize uh, government collections from persons and businesses. Are there, do we have any specific targets um, with regards to this? Uh, I mean, perhaps uh, at some point, maybe in a couple of years, we expect to be 100. Uh, maybe there's a larger proportion of... Uh, Payments directly from to government. Is there? Do we have any specific targets that we are uh, um, aiming for? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair. For specifically for governments, uh, there is no specific target. But for the overall level of digitalization in the country, the target is that by the end of the year twenty twenty three, we should have reached the level of fifty percent uh, digitalization. And maybe the DICT can answer this. Is there a sufficient infrastructure to support a nationwide uh, uh, digitalization? I mean, of course, when you're talking about the rural areas, do we have uh, the necessary infrastructure to implement that on uh, a large scale? Okay. For the moment, as we uh, as we speak, uh, we. We have a list of uh, channels already. I think we are quite ready, but uh, it's quite decentralized, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, I think it's best for us to unify also all the effort. Right now, it's quite like a decentralized a Frankenstein you know, technology. That's why we cannot trace, uh, as uh, mentioned by BSP a while ago, um, identity verification is also one of the uh, um, problem right now. Because if we're talking about the cryptocurrency and e-payment, they are actually interconnected. Uh, E-payment is being used like a bridge between the real money to the crypto money or digital money. So I guess if we're going to fix the e-payment problems uh, in the Philippines, we, we will also fix the cryptocurrency problems also in the future, Mr. Chair. For the moment, uh, I may say that it's not yet established. It's quite very decentralized and scattered. Yes, I think there's a great need for... Uh... Uh, coordination with the uh, respective departments because even with, with these things, it requires a certain level of physical infrastructure to implement a uh, full uh, government uh, digitalization. So I, I just hope that uh, hopefully uh, we can uh, craft a bill that will also uh, help uh, expedite this uh, goal. At the same time, I hope that there will be a greater coordination between the respective uh, departments to make this uh, goal uh, achievable in the near future. Thank you. And yeah, thank you. Uh, at this point, the SEC will brief on the brief us on the state of the non-bank financial sector. Honorable Mark Villar. The members of this honorable committee, fellow financial regulators, colleagues in government, research persons, good morning. I am honored to appear before you today, and the SEC would like to express our support for your initiative in regulating digital or virtual assets. The fast-moving advancements in technology have resulted not only in the development of consumer products, but in financial instruments as well. At present, we have been trying our best to apply laws and regulations specifically created for traditional securities to these products brought about by innovation. Our jurisdiction with the current mandate is to regulate digital or virtual assets that are considered investment contracts using canonical principles first laid down in the 1930s. 
Although not powerless, the regulators would like to seek more recognition of virtual or digital assets in the eyes of the law as it will guide us in its proper treatment. A great challenge to this is that some innovators develop these products with the intention to be outside the ambit of the law. Decentralization is the main focus of the developers in the hopes of not having to deal with any government regulation. Another is anonymity, which had been used to perpetrate illegal activities. A number of pump and dump schemes have been affected to manipulate the market. U.S. SEC Chairman Gensler characterized the space as the Wild West that is ripe with fraud, scams, and abuse. With the increase in technological literacy, more and more of our retail investors have been buying into these kinds of investment schemes. We have observed that average Filipinos, including our OFWs and wage earners, have invested in these projects because of their hype and hope of a bountiful return. As a result, a lot have lost, if not all, their hard-earned money. A lot of scammers have adopted cryptocurrency in their modus operandi because of its unfamiliarity and vagueness in regulation. We see a clear gap in the space and we need additional legislation to prevent transactions, products, and platforms from falling between regulatory cracks. With a new law, the legislature may empower the concerned agencies with a definite authority to regulate these unconventional financial products. Though we have accomplished several objectives, we would like to provide the best public service to the Filipino people through clear directives and regulations. We welcome this initiative on digital assets to uh, help us in our mandate to not only provide for investor protection, but also foster innovation. Thank you. Lastly, we join our colleagues of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas in strongly supporting the passage of the amendment of the bank secrecy law towards also the SIM card reg registration bill and the digital payments bill. Now, at this stage, Mr. Chair, may I request that uh, Commissioner Kelvin B, the Supervisor Commissioner for Markets and Securities as well as the FinTech space, be recognized to give the state of the capital markets and uh, the present direction of the commission. Uh, yes, he's here. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. With your notice, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, Senators, ladies and gentlemen. For today's briefing, I hope the PowerPoint is up now. Uh, for today's briefing, we will follow this basic outline. Next slide, please. Starting from the capital markets and securities updates through the current and planned actions and regulations of the SEC in relation to digital assets. Next slide, please. Following that uh, outline, we'll start with the capital market updates. Next slide, please. Now, aside from being the company registrar, the SEC is actually in charge of the capital markets as well. So in this slide, we are showing the different capital market institutions, including that of the exchanges, the clearing agencies, the depository, the self-regulatory organizations, among others. And next slide, please. Further, uh, these different capital market institutions are being regulated under the Securities Regulation Code under the following provisions. Uh, the, the, the provisions that you see in front of you there. Next slide, please. Now for our updates, as of the end of July 2022, the capital raised through the PSE, the Philippine Stock Exchange, from primary and secondary offerings was valued at 18.56 billion pesos, while capital raised through initial public offerings, including private placements and stock rights offering reached 73.52 billion pesos. This equity fundraising activities include eight initial public offerings, which brings the total number of listed companies to 284, and the market capitalization as of the end of July 31, 2022, stood at 16.27 trillion pesos. Currently, the Philippine Stock Exchange has 124 trading participants as of August 15, 2022. Next slide, please. For the fixed income market uh, via the Philippines Dealing Exchange, also known as PDEX, Total capital raised from 19 listings as of July 2022 amounted to 352.12 billion pesos. Two of those listings are sustainability bonds from two bank issuers uh, worth 67.46 billion pesos. 
the total tradable corporate securities as of the end of July reached 1.37 trillion pesos, issued by 53 companies and comprise of 191 securities. There are also five new issues with indicative amount of 49 billion pesos to be raised in the coming pipeline from August to November 2022. Next slide, please. Other significant events as of date in the fixed income market is the BDO's 52.7 billion peso issuance, which is the largest single bond issuance by a private corporation and the largest Philippine peso denominated ASEAN sustainability bond issue. Meanwhile, the two largest historical issuances of firms are Ayala Land's 33 billion pesos and SMC Global Power's 40 billion peso issuances. There are also three upcoming listings which are made in issuances or issuers. And I'd like to point out, uh, Senators, uh, Mr. Chairman, that a historic event in the Philippine capital market was the first ever digital bond issuance and listing which utilized the PDTC digital registry and digital depository through the Union Bank of the Philippines, which listed 11 billion pesos on June 2, 2022. The first trades and settlements of the UDDP digital bonds also used DDP to PDTC Digital Depository and BSP Fill Pass Plus. Next slide, please. For the next update, we'll just talk very quickly uh, on the mutual funds. Next slide, uh, as updates. Currently, there are 76 total registered investment companies from 64 in 2017, which shows an 18% increase in number. Likewise, the assets under management showed an upward trend, even in the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic which is now at 435.6 billion pesos as of June 2022. It showed a huge growth by 22% in total AUM uh, assets under management from 2020 to 2021. This growth may be attrib attributable to the broadening reach of different online platforms during the nationwide lockdowns, as they provided the investors with easy access to marketing materials, as well as online financial services. Next slide, please. Now, out of the 76 registered investment companies, the top two classifications of funds are the equity and the fixed income funds. Uh, for, for elaboration and for clarification, an equity fund refers to an investment company with the objective to invest predominantly in or hold equity instruments, such as stocks listed in exchange, while fixed income refers to an investment company which invests in fixed income products, which may come in the form of corporate bonds, treasury bills, treasury bonds, certificates of deposits. Now, as to the number of deposits, the industry has seen very consistent growth over the years. As seen on the chart before you, as of June 2022, the total number of accounts are pegged at 860,000 accounts from the original 382,000 accounts in 2017, which is approximately 125% increase. Next slide, please. Allow us now to talk about the uh, current plans and regulations of the SEC concerning digital assets. Now, since the boom of digital assets in the Philippines back in 2017, the SEC has been actively monitoring already digital asset, the digital asset space, and we've tried to regulate and enforce existing laws. Now, the, the SEC has operated on the idea that some digital assets, which as of January 2018 were called virtual currencies, fall under our jurisdiction based on the facts and circumstances surrounding that issue, their issuance. In fact, in 2018, despite the lack of a formal definition of virtual currencies, and at that time, no extended grant of jurisdiction over virtual currencies, the SEC saw it saw fit to regulate these products as securities, particularly investment contracts, to ensure that investor protection is present in these innovative financial products. Next slide, please. Now, by way of background, just to, to be clear as to where we're coming from on this, the SEC is mandated and fully prepared to deal with emerging innovations, including digital assets. Section 27 of the Securities Regulation Code, the SRC, grants the, F the SEC the power to enact rules for the regulation, registration, and licensing of innovative and other trading markets or exchanges covering the issuances and trading of innovative securities. So as the champion in investor protection, which is part of our mandate, the SEC has actually, actually and proactively taken action to address the rise of emerging financial technology or fintech innovations to allow the industry to grow and flourish and also to address problems in financial inclusion while ensuring that consumer investor rights remain fully protected. And next slide, please. Now, based on that mandate, on July 31, 2021, the SEC uh, created the SEC Fintech Innovation Office, also known as Filipino, 
Now, it was created to focus on the regulation of the increase of unauthorized or unregulated fintech, create better, perform, better informed policies for the regulation of new and existing fintech, and to capacitate the commission with technical expertise on how to regulate fintech. And of course, to promote an innovative culture within the SEC. This office, uh, Senators, it is modeled after existing frameworks, structures, and best practices of other jurisdictions, such as that in uh, the UK, the US, uh, and it, but it is optimized to fit the fintech landscape here in the Philippines, of course. And next slide, please. So through the SEC's fintech office, the general direction of the SEC, uh, we, we, we categorize as follows. First, the application of existing securities regulations to fintech-related activities. It is our position that despite the lack of a specific law for the regulation of digital assets today, or perhaps the non-issuance or lack of fintech-specific regulations or law, the law remains clear. The SRC in particular remains clear as to what constitutes a regulated activity under existing securities laws and regulations. So thus applying current existing laws, we at the SEC regularly issue warnings and clarifications on the regulatory treatment of these emerging fintech activities. So we've issued through our operating departments, company-specific advisories and general advisories, which, is, which usually serves as an investment warning to the general public and, of course, guidance to companies which aspire to conduct fintech-related activities. And so with, that, uh, with those activities in mind, we have been imposing fintech regulations. Uh, we will be imposing fintech regulations based on three approaches. First, placement of fintech-specific licensing regimes. Second, modification of existing regulations with the addition of fintech-specific uh, requirements. And third, outright prohibition of certain activities. Next slide, please. Now, included in our policy direction is the consideration of other areas of digitalization, such as data privacy, cybersecurity, money laundering, terrorist financing. Uh, next slide, please. Now, to put the uh, to, to put into action our mandate to regulate digital asset, we try to keep ourselves uh, adept with the ever-changing developments in fintech and security, uh, cybersecurity landscape, to determine how it intersects with our uh, our jurisdiction. And the most notable effort that I'd like to point out, uh, Senators, is our effort to draft the digital asset offerings and the digital asset exchange rules. These rules are currently being reviewed and revised based on the comments received by several fintech proponents and, of course, the general public. It seeks to finally address how digital assets and cryptocurrency-related activities ought to be regulated for the investment of technical, technological innovations while upholding customer investor protection. We also, I'd like to point out, uh, Senators, that the agency has also partnered with Google to prevent Filipinos from accessing crypto advertisements which are unregistered. This is in line with the SEC's advisory to Filipinos to avoid dealing with unregistered foreign entities because it will leave them with no domestic remedy to recover their money in case of any misconduct con uh, committed by these unregistered foreign entities. Next slide, please. Now, since the boom in popularity of uh, initial coin offerings. Oh, sorry, next slide, please. There, there. Um, the SEC has been active in the enforcement of our securities laws in dealing with the sale of unregistered securities. Next slide, please. So for instance, uh, there, uh, there. On January 23, 2018, the SEC issued its first cease and desist order against Joseph Palata and his three firms, namely Black Cell Technology, Black Sand Capital, and Black Cell Technology Limited, the, the latter being based in Hong Kong. This action triggered an investigation in the Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission and the Hong Kong Companies Registration, our counterparts in Hong Kong, which led to their enforcement actions. Uh, the SFC, which is the Securities and Futures Commission of Hong Kong, considered that the top points could amount to a collective investment scheme that requires prior registration. Uh, next slide, please. We'd also like to point out, uh, uh, Senators, that, uh, oh, sorry, there we go that since 2017, we have issued more than 50 advisories against companies and groups of people who offer digital assets or digital asset-enabled investment offerings. These investment offerings make it appear that they are using, supposedly, digital assets as a medium for evolving their traditional way of business, uh, when in reality, they're actually making such an appearance to defraud others you know, uh, into giving them their hard-earned money and essentially scamming them. Now, on June 30, 2020, the SEC actually issued a cease and desist order against Forsage, uh, Forsage Philippines and its officers. These companies were offering digital asset investments via their official website, which is considered a public offering by any definition under the Securities Regulation Code, and therefore should have been subjected to strict registration requirements. 
Now, as soon as that cease and desist order was issued by the SEC uh, Philippines, the US SEC asked for assistance from our agency. And of course, we gave it our utmost attention. And on, on August 1, 2022, just three weeks ago, the US SEC charged Corsage with investment fraud. So in short, ladies and gentlemen, we came first. The, the Philippine SEC actually found and saw this first. And in fact, in a, the US SEC, in its press release, commended us, the Philippine SEC, for its Finds it important that we also understand how these digital assets are booked. Sorry, uh, next slide on accounting. There we go. Thank you. We also find it important, senators, to understand how these digital assets are booked in the accounting books of holders and issuers. So, uh, so on February 13, 2019, the Philippine Interpretations Committee, of which our SEC general accountant is a member uh, of the Financial Reporting Standards Council under the Professional Regulatory Commission, the PRC, issued Q&A 2019 uh, 02, which is entitled Accounting for Cryptographic Assets. So that is something, that is a point of, of uh, concern and uh, focus for us as well. Next slide, please. Now, as for priority projects for the year, we've included four items in the digital asset agenda. Most notable is what I mentioned earlier, the planned issuance of the special rules on digital asset offerings and digital asset exchanges to address the growing interest of Filipinos in dealing with cryptocurrencies. These rules aim, as I mentioned earlier, to encourage financial inclusion while ensuring that customer and investor protection is upheld. Uh, last, next slide, last slide. Uh, so I, we just like to point out, Senators, that despite the lack of a special law, the SEC, uh, of a special law granting the SEC the jurisdiction to or specific jurisdiction to regulate digital asset, the SEC nonetheless exerted its efforts to uh, exercise its regulatory mandate to uphold our job of encouraging financial inclusion while ensuring that investors' rights are duly protected. So, but uh, I think this is the, the crux of the matter, sirs. We can only do so much under current laws. So our mandate on regulating digital asset continues to be challenged you know, uh, by, by uh, so-called experts, uh, probably. And that this is a, a perennial problem for other regulators all throughout the world uh, that are regulated, that other securities commissions face the same problem. So absent a specific law granting as jurisdiction, that is something that will continue to be an issue, I believe. Thus, we are fully supportive of the digital assets bill that was uh, uh, submitted by the Senator Marcos because it would allow the fragmented recognition of different government agencies and authorize a single regulator or perhaps two to implement a regulation. This would further strengthen the promotion of financial inclusion, uh, combat money laundering and terrorist financing, and of course, ensure investor and consumer protection. And with that, I think the SEC, we are done, uh, sirs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we can now proceed with our initial hearing on the following measures referred to the committee as uh, Senate Bill Number 184, an act recognizing digital assets, requiring the registration of digital asset enterprises, their operators, and for other purposes by Senator. Uh, yeah, and if there are no more questions from the members, uh, we can proceed. Oh, yes, uh, Senator Wynn. Mr. Chair, I just have a few questions uh, regarding the uh, presentation. Uh, number one, on the bank secrecy law, on the proposal to amend the bank secrecy law. Um, I'll just, uh, well, I'll direct this to BSP. And uh, I'll just play devil's advocate, Mr. Chair, because we all know the reason why this proposal has not been uh, successful in the past, no? because a lot of our constituents feel um, threatened and also afraid that the uh, removal of bank secrecy law might be used to harass businessmen, might harass uh, public servants and others. So um, what assurance uh, or what modifications? I, I know I heard it over the um, uh, over the presentation, but I want to reiterate it uh, through this question. What assurance and what modification have we has the BSP uh, uh, initiated you know, to allay fears that uh, a relaxation of uh, the bank secrecy law might lead to such um, abuse? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, in previous uh, bills filed, uh, it's more expansive, meaning it's really an amendment to bank secrecy in the sense that it covers all types of deposit, all types of transactions. 
In this case, it will be very, very limited to uh, fraud uh, or illegal activities committed by insiders, meaning bank officers, directors, stockholders, and their agents. So number one, very limited. So even if you are committing fraud or violations of law, but you are not an insider in the bank, meaning that's, there are money launderers using the bank, then we cannot look into that. It has to be committed by bank officers, stockholders, and their agents or uh, others uh, acting in their behalf. So very, very limited. And number two, the grounds are also very limited, meaning on uh, illegal activities are fraud transactions of these people using the bank. So you have to use that bank. And thirdly, unlike in the old charter of the central bank, where an examiner can look into deposit during the course of regular examination or special, this time it cannot be done. What the examiner can do is if, it, if he detects these activities, then the examiner has to go to the monetary board itself and, and present evidence that there is a probable cause that these accounts are being abused by the insiders. And only the monetary board can authorize the examination to look into this deposit. So these are very stringent requirements. We, cannot, we are not covering all other laws being violated, like laundering, etc. So we are very, very targeted. So, and of course, there is a sanction if there will be a violation or abuse. So, it really departs from the earlier bills <clears throat> whereby there is a wholesale uh, amendment of bank secrecy. We just curb out a very small portion. So, it's targeted, Mr. Chair. So, Mr. Chair, just to re reiterate, these are, uh, I saw in the presentation, entities that are subject to the supervision of BSP. Yes, Mr. Chair. Well, what are those entities, sir? Banks, essentially banks, because they are the ones with deposit banks. Non-banks, they do not have deposits. So essentially, we're looking at all types of banks, except non-stock uh, non savings and loan association. So, mga banko, rural yes. banks, thrift rural, banks. Yeah, digital uh, banks, universal banks, Islamic banks. Okay. And then, uh, what are the triggers, uh, sir? For example, what will trigger um, a, um, a uh, examination of those uh, bank yeah. accounts? Do you need a court order? What's the uh, uh, okay. trigger? Now, actually, what will trigger it is, number one, there is either a regular or a special examination. Because by law, we do a regular examination or it can be a special now, during the course of that examination, meaning during that period of examination, uh, if a bank examiner looking into the transactions of the bank finds probable cause, meaning uh, it's, a, it's a higher, it's a quantum of evidence that these accounts are being used by the insiders to commit violations of law or serious irregularity, then, and they can connect the serious irregularity with the accounts, then that is the trigger. They go back to the board and make a report. The, it's the board that investigates? The monetary board will now authorize to look into. Okay, but it's, it's not, a monetary board that determines probable cause? Yes, Mr. Chair. They have to establish before the board. They, they have an initial determination, but that is not binding on the board. The board has to be satisfied that there is probable cause. So there is a correction between the insider's accounts, and the illegal activity. All right. And then what will happen after, for example, the bank accounts were examined and then there's, uh, uh, some, there's fraud that were yeah. uh, discovered? So, what will be the subsequent action? Yes, actually, two things can happen. Number one, uh, we can sanction the bank administratively, meaning the normal uh, sanctions no, against the banks, or the BSP can file a criminal case. And BSP can now use that particular evidence in the DOJ and in the courts. So a case will, I uh, know, um, the next action will be a case filed by, is it the Monetary Board or BSP? It's the BSP, Mr. It's the BSP Chair. That yeah, files we have it. a specialized group for investigating bank fraud. Will that account be frozen? Will that account be uh, fro frozen because of this? Uh, incident? Uh, we have not included a provision on precinct, but once a court case is filed, uh, we can apply in the court itself 
a judicial authority for freezing, but it's not in the law. We'll just apply the normal authority of the court to issue a freeze order. All right. Okay. Well, we, we, may I request, Mr. Chair, a copy of that uh, proposal yeah, so we that will. we can uh, uh, study it. It's truly a departure from the old uh, uh, understanding of uh, the bank's, the amendment of the bank secrecy law. Yes, Mr. No, Chair, no. we'll provide the committee a copy. I think it's a much tamer and a more targeted uh, approach to uh, the modification of the bank secrecy law. Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, actually, that's the output when we had that exposed also in the lower house. Mm -hmm. uh, us. Thank you, sir. On a separate note, Mr. Chair, if I have, uh, I have a few more questions. Is that, is it? Yes, uh, yes, please proceed, uh, Senator. I have a questions So at the end. Uh, I saw in some news reports um, about the selling of e-wallets. You know, and I think the police had, had cracked down a few of these in the past. No? Uh, let me just pull it out. Um, Group oh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think there were. I think there's a modus. No, we're in. Obviously, they use anonymous uh, prepaid SIM cards. That's why we have to file that. I agree with you. No, filing the prepaid SIM card uh, law, uh, and then they open up um, e-wallets. No, uh, because opening up e-wallets uh, can be done remotely or it can be done uh, through digital means. And uh, there's a rampant uh, sale of these digital wallets. And apparently, the PNP said over the news reports that these wallets are being used to launder money, to, um, to harass, and to, to do other cybercrime um, issues. Uh, I just want to, first of all, is this part of BSP's regulatory uh, ambit? Or is it SEC? And or and then second, uh, what are we doing to curb this? No, because moving forward, there's so many digital wallets uh, spouting. No, there's one for Grab, there's one for Shopee, there's one uh, almost all. No, of the major uh, applications. And uh, uh, in the absence of a uh, prepaid SIM card law, uh, what are what, what is government doing to curb and to arrest? the uh, proliferation of um, fake or, or, or this type of digital wallets? Ms. Uh, Director Plabasan can perhaps yeah. answer that question, yeah. Mr. Chair. It's under BSP, digital wallets? Yes, this is under the BSP's regulator. You mentioned about some of the wallets. Yeah, uh, yeah. Gcash, 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 Gmaya, yeah. All They that. are considered as e-money issuers in the Philippines and they are regulated by the BSP. So, Mr. Chair, we have several rules and regulations governing uh, uh, fishing, etc. Basically, they are used for and e even for uh, other illicit activities. So, uh, plus, of course, we are also requiring these entities to have a um, massive public information campaign. Plus, of course, there was a mention about the Financial uh, Accounts Regulation Act that will also help uh, in terms of providing more clarity with, uh, particularly on the sanctions. Let's say if people would rent or would sell their, their accounts. But there are cases already that, uh, that were filed with uh, the OJ regarding these types of uh, illicit activities. First of all, how do we stop it? How do we stop it? Is it the responsibility of the e-wallet uh, operator or is it government that should um, put uh, some form of uh, regulation uh, before they can open uh, e-wallets. No, we have to balance that because the, yes, the yes, part yes. of the come on of e-wallets, it's convenient. Yeah, but that convenience can be abused, obviously. Yes. No, yes. right yes. now. So, but uh, without any action, uh, we'll see this type of uh, 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 of, of crime no? uh, flourishing in our country. You know, and uh, how do we, first of all, whose responsibility should it be to stop it? And then number two, how do we stop it? Yeah. No? First and foremost, I think the, 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 to answer the question, it's not only a whole of government approach. Eh? Probably it's a whole of society approach. Because first, you need to educate the, the people regarding how to protect their digital intent, in identity, how to properly use their e-wallets. Second, if they commit crimes, that definitely the, the certainty that they will be punished would also help, right? And third, of course, 
on the part of the BSP, it's uh, issuing dynamic regulations to ensure that e-money issuers and even digital banks and traditional banks are adapt are adapting robust cybersecurity measures. So it's really a whole of government, whole of society approach, Mr. Chair. In a nutshell, what have you done to stop this type of action? We in have. A Initially, we have collaborated, uh, of, aside from the, I mentioned, I already mentioned about the regulations, aside from the, because Mr. Chair, the problem, it's evolving. And right now, kasi with the, uh, with the uh, massive use of e-wallets, even bank accounts the, uh, from digital or digital banks, uh, then. So, una, the, the BSP, of course, the regulation. We are also collaborating with industry associations regarding information sharing, regarding how to, let's say, how to facilitate investigation of these types of crimes because normally it would entail multiple institutions. Eh? So, uh, the, the, an account opened in one, uh, in an e-wallet, can be used, let's say, to transfer money to another bank. So it would require really collaboration when it comes to investigation. And of course, the, the, the justice system as well. The certainty that if cases will be filed against people who, who allowed their accounts to be used for illicit activities, will the certainty of punishment. How many uh, people were already convicted, uh, sir, uh, 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 regarding uh, this? We, we 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 can check with uh, with the law enforcement agency. Oh, because I'm I'm trying to get uh, straight answers from BSP on how to stop this type of scam. No, because uh, uh, of course we support uh, fintech, we support digitalization, but uh, again, no, the, um, a lot of a lot of abuse is happening uh, in the part of uh, uh, criminals. So I'm I'm trying to get the. Uh, some straight answer on what BSP is doing to stop it you know, so that uh, we will not get those type of news reports uh, anymore. You know? um, and of course, uh, how many people were punished or, and convicted? I'm trying to get a straight answer, sir. Because, you know? yeah. Mr. Chair, the, 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 the mandate of the BSP is really more on, on regulation, right? So what we can do is to regulate the institutions to ensure that they have... Uh, not only robust cybersecurity measures, but also consumer education program. But we can also, we are also doing collaboration with law enforcement agencies to facilitate the investigation of, of these cases. That's why we constantly collaborate with PNP, Cybercrime Group, and even NBI when it comes to case, when cases uh, reach their jurisdiction. May I comment, Mr. Chair? Um, yes, please proceed. Um, just a, um, um, maybe a re recommendation from the technologies and I, I guess, and, and I believe that policy will not be efficient here. I think we need to embed technology to policy because, uh, you know, we cannot arrest anyone without trace, right? And policy cannot based on just presumption because they are not compliant to a certain policy. But I believe that, uh, technology can be embedded in the policy later on and, uh, um, uh, part of the solution here may be with, in the absence of the an, an national EKYC system, Mr. Chair, and uh, Mr. Bash Chair is also one of the biggest problems here because anyone can just open an e-wallet and there was no verification. In fact, last week, Mr. Chair, and we're willing to show you one of the technology that DICT is also uh, developing is called the EKYC system. This is to uh, properly implement uh, um, not only for ease of doing business to expedite, you know, uh, and avoid any redundancy of data verification in the future, but the identity verification is very important as well. And uh, I think uh, the ICT is also in a very good uh, position now to uh, somehow not only help on the financial technology, but also in the e-banking sector to make sure that they'll be able to open accounts even remotely. Because in the typical point of view in the banking sector, you have to go to a bank and you have to bring your documentation and you have to physically you know, uh, tell to the bank that, hey, this is, this is me. And these, these are my documents. But in the, in, the, uh, in the absence of physical verification, since digital um, banking, including cryptocurrency and digital assets verification, is now being done, you know, let, let's call it in, in a ghostly manner, because anyone can own a, a digital asset nowadays without even knowing he is the real person who owns it. So meaning if there is no identity verification, 
um, financial technology or even fraudsters can easily transmit a uh, big amount of money from person to person without identity. So meaning how could we arrest anyone here without trace? And uh, my humble suggestion is to embed technology as policy so that we will have trace in the future so that we can really arrest people who are, who, who are really, you know, because a cryptocurrency and even the digital assets are, can, be, can be abused actually, not only for, you know, fraudsters or scammers, but uh, investment scam will be, will be there. Money laundering will be there. So I guess technology can be used as a tool okay, by BSP in the future to, you know, to really investigate and arrest someone who's really violating the law. Okay. They just, uh, did you mention, so you were developing a digital payment platform? For, is that, did I understand that correctly? The DICT? Um, yes. Part of the uh, um, task in the uh, e-governance side is uh, to have not, not, not a payment gateway, but maybe a verifier later on so that any... Uh, uh, e-payment channel will have uh, an equal, you know, um, chance to 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 uh, to use and uh, and uh, nourish their own e-payment gateways and solutions. But we need to have a check and balance here. You know? Check and balance. Just being done in coordination with the LSP. Chat. Uh, it's actually part of our internal uh, because we have our we have to promote uh, cashless payments also to the ICT. So the plan is to coordinate to uh, BSP for further guidance also as well. Yeah, me. But how about uh, sir uh, the national ID? Have we used it to its full potential? Because uh, the national ID is supposed to. Um, stop this type of uh, anonymous applications yeah. because um, the national ID is supposed to be uh, one, one, one is to one, you know, one is to one basis. So have we used that uh, uh, mechanism? Right now, the national, things very limited, uh, the, the implementation is very limited, but some institutions can already validate identity using the, the field sys uh, information. But I would just like to clarify, Mr. Chair, that the, the, the statement that you can just open an account. I'm sure some of you may have already opened accounts with these EMIs and virtual asset uh, service providers, particularly those that are registered with the BSP. They go through verification process. It's just, just, it's just that they are the first one that implemented uh, technology-aided KYC. I mean, you do not have to present yourself, but I'm sure you have experience already doing facial recognition, submitting a photocopy of your ID. That's one way. So there's an artificial intelligence behind all of this that determines if you're a fake person. So that can, that's why some, some of these people have already been... I mean, th there were cases filed against these people because they they cannot be traced because... I mean, they used uh, legitimate uh, IDs, right? So... That's why the, 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 the advice from the BSP is always deal only with BSP registered entities because they go through stringent licensing process. We check their onboarding, we, we check the, the infrastructure, the particularly security infrastructure. So, but on the national ID, hopefully once it's fully implemented, that will also facilitate validation. So it will make validation of the identity of the users more efficient. And of course, it can. It will be easy to file cases against those who, who are using this for their illegal or fraudulent activities. Uh, Mr. Chair, just to share, no. Um, last year, I had I was victimized by identity theft, and uh, one million worth of uh, alcohol was bought using my credit card. No, because somebody present. Pre pretended to be Senator Gachalian and bought alcohol. Hindi naman ako ganun kalakas uminom, Mr. Chair. No? But uh, uh, alcohol is a fast-moving item. Eh. So you buy expensive alcohol, you sell low, you create sales. No? So that's the modus. But, but one thing I learned, no? and, and, and I say this with uh, respect, is uh, these criminals are more innovative eh? and they're more responsive responsive to policy and to regulation no? meaning they study the regulation they study technology they study the loopholes no and uh, they manage to um, evade the regulation and uh, policy no masyado tayong mabagal in other words and this is this guy which i credit nbi for apprehending is, is a uh, 21 year old guy 
no, who uh, as, who's a student. No, he just studied carefully the loopholes. He's not even a tech expert. No, he just pretended to be sh Senator Gachalian and managed to uh, change the number of my OTP and got the OTP. No, as simple as that. No, but the moral lesson there is these guys know the weakness, the weaknesses of policy and regulation. So. I'm just. In, I just want to encourage the regulators, Mr. Chair, to stay ahead of the curve, no. And uh, marami pang ganyan, no. The e-wallet is just uh, the tip of the iceberg. I'm sure marami pa. I, I hear some uh, some uh, news about uh, fake bank accounts, no, being sold in some platforms. So the proliferation of uh, uh, digital um, uh, accounts, um, fake digital accounts will be uh, a norm no? and uh, I would like to encourage the regulator to to stay ahead of the curve because the criminals are really staying ahead of of government no? so that's my moral lesson mr chair uh that's very uh, interesting laki pala ng nakuha that's a anong klaseng alak ba yung binili niya i had mr chair uh uh, I notice in the list mostly are high end um, alcohol because I, the the they buy they buy it from a dealer at uh, at a cheap price because libre naman yon and then they sell sell it high basically walang capital eh no so wala, they don't have any capital because it's uh, it's it's bought through a platform. No? Thank you, uh, Senator, for yes, uh, Mr. Chair. sharing with us. Yeah, yes, uh, Senator uh, Angara, you are recognized. May we be permitted a few questions, Mr. Chair, to our resource persons? Yes, please proceed. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair, uh, dear colleagues, and to our uh, uh, BSP officials, SEC officials, and uh, our guests from resource persons from the banking and financial sectors. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, I've been following the discussion, no? and uh, regarding the uh invest investigation of scams uh i guess the uh is are we still relying on the securities regulation code when we investigate online or digital uh you know platforms uh, investment scams yes. uh, mr chair may i respond for the sec Yes, proceed. Okay. Uh, President, as yes, mentioned in my preliminary statement, we are relying on the Securities Regulation Code, particularly Section 8 thereof, uh, which provides that no securities can will be offered within the Philippines unless they are registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission. So what we do in most of the ponds and permitting scams is to uh, evaluate them following the Howey test for investment contracts. If they are found to follow the, the four tests there, like the investment of money, uh, common enterprise, expectation of profits, then we issue uh, an enforcement action, including the advisories, the cease and desist orders, and even revocation of the, the their corporate uh, uh, certificate, and even pursue criminal action thereon. Uh, so that's as far as SEC is concerned, which our uh, U.S. SEC counterparts are uh, resorting to. Um, so, so so far, there have been convictions under Section 8, I think Section 28 with respect to market professionals, and Section 26 of the Securities Regulation Code for Fraud. There have been convictions of digital uh, offerings made digitally. Uh, there, uh, unfortunately, Walapa was a digital offerings. But there have been enforcement actions, like what we, uh, I think, Com Commissioner Lee mentioned about crop coins, uh, the plan of uh, selling initial coin offerings and raising funds from the public. So we were able to issue a cease and desist order and have the, well, not the revocation because they are unregistered, but what we did was to coordinate with the Hong Kong uh, Securities and Futures Commission for purposes of revoking the license of the Hong Kong-based company. Right. How about blocking the website? Is that part of the enforcement uh, or prevention, preventive actions that, that is available? Yes, uh, Your Honor. Uh, we uh, 
that that's part of the action that uh, that we will we we seek. But of course, that that is not within the uh, capability of the SEC to enforce. So, but what we do is to write the concerned government agencies, including our foreign counterpart, to do their 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 share in let's say closing down. And in, in fact, the Securities and Futures Commission required the uh, the group of uh, Kalata back then to return the investments they were able to raise through those websites, which were based in Hong Kong. So who do you have to write in the domestic, I mean, within the domestic framework? You have to write the DOJ, Ganun or to, to shut down a website? Uh, presently, what we do is an uh, uh, issuance of, let's say, a cease and desist order or an advisory, in which case uh, we furnish the, 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 the proper, of course, it's, it's, it's published in the, it's published in our website as well as in our uh, social media accounts for purposes of white dissemination. Uh, and then, in fact, we noted that even the banks have considered the issuance of uh, cease and desist orders of the SEC as well as advisories for purposes of uh, uh, raising the, 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 the red flag on accounts that are, uh, that are in, their, in, in their banks, in their respective banks. Yeah, I'm just trying to get a grasp, Mr. Chair, on the nature of the new financial frauds. Because eh? a cease and desist order is a tool used in actual physical ano, eh, uh, investigations yeah. because you can actually physically monitor uh, compliance. But yes. in terms of digital uh, fraud, parang the nature of the beast or the nature of what you're regulating is already kind of beyond your physical... Ano, eh, be, it, it, yeah. potentially it's yeah. millions or even billions of uh, potentially uh, um, of people uh, getting defrauded so I'm wondering if a CDO is still the most effective that's why I was asking about uh, you know blocking access to websites and everything if that is a more effective uh, tool of regulation or what what do the authorities think I'm just wondering thinking aloud actually Mr. Chair yeah uh, thank you your honor actually we are supporting the passage of the law which will provide us and grant us jurisdiction. Instead of us uh, relying on a practical move, which we have been uh, uh, using in for purposes of implementation uh, against uh, securities fraud. But if armed with the proper legislation, if the SEC will have the, I, I, at least uh, the, I think our advantage is that we have an enforcement department. That, that's why uh, our action has been a bit faster and, and uh, we are able to use the tactical legal fiction of investment contracts in stopping a lot of fraud. Uh, but I, I think that that's the thing. It, it's, it's antiquated, and, and as, we, as we mentioned in the preliminary statement, that, that, that uh, goes back to the 1930s, uh, since our laws have been patterned after the Securities Act and the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. So it will be best so that given the present uh, financial technology landscape that we will be able, and we are armed with all, with all the authorities to be to do our job as, as we should. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll move on. I just wanted to proceed from that point uh, raised by Senator Gadsalian about staying ahead of the curve. I think this is one aspect uh, that we must recognize that technology makes it much easier to defraud uh, people. Okay. But I'll move on to the evidentiary requirements under the current securities law you can be prosecuted just for selling an unregistered security diba uh din yeah. ba sa virtual ano just by virtue of operating a website where you offer yourself as as uh, providing you know income from certain investments uh for through a website just by virtue of opening that website and that that, that the public can access is that already something you can prosecute under the current Securities Act? Because, uh, or do you need to prove actual defraudation or actual uh, uh, cases where uh, more than 20 people relied uh, on this? Uh, I'm just wondering what the evidentiary uh, requirements are for, for digital, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, yes, Mr. Senator. Actually, uh, the defraudation is no different from the classic uh, Ponzi and uh, pyramiding scams of the past. It's written in paper. This time, it's even even it's much faster because you are tapping on the virtual, virtual world in in 
in, in getting hold of of your potential victims. So must napapadali. And and, and and I agree with you that the scammers appear to be always ahead because every 24 hours of the day, probably they're, they're, the only thing they're, they're thinking is to find ways on how to scam people. So regulators, that's, that's why I think the advantage of this is you have a dedicated enforcement department. And, and now we just created a cyber crime division. As well no, as the I, I, I have a more focused. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, Chairperson uh, yeah. Aquino. No, but yeah. my specific question was: when when someone sells an unregistered security, that's already an offense under yeah. the securities regulation code, diba? Is it the same for if 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 a person opens a website that is not registered as a security with the commission, and then he offers that that to the public? Is that already a violation in itself, equivalent to it sell, selling without a prospectus? Yes, sir. Kasi actually, ganun din, din po eh. Uh, if, if you are doing the offering orally or through just uh, some printed form, that, that already would fall under uh, Section 8. So the mere opening uh, of the website is already punishable under as, as selling an unregulated, uh, an unregistered security? Yes, mostly. In fact, it's easier to, to uh, build the case because... They are there. there. We, we can all, always have it them, them documented. Okay. So, yun lang. Yun lang ang tanong ko, actually. If, is the presence of a mere website already uh, a violation, considered a violation under securities law? Without a need yes, of being actual defraudation or reliance on the information provided? Uh, okay. Uh, we we'll make a distinction. For purposes of our enforcement action, which is administrative in nature, we can already build an advisory, and then uh, we level up to uh, the cease and desist order if, if they persist. Uh, and and then of course the last thing, which which is a bit difficult to prove, is really the uh, what, uh, you know uh, criminal uh, liability that need need to be before the Department of Justice. So there there have to be indicted accordingly, probable cause having to be. Uh, certain and and determined, and then of course we we go to the courts. Now the the fast way to wrap up is put a stop to these scams is really to consider our enforcement capabilities and action. Uh, as a last resort, if the the scam is pervasive, that's the time we resort to criminal action. Though. Okay, thank you. I'll move on from the. Uh, the regulation aspect i'd like to tackle some of the recent or or some of the laws are uh, in the sector uh regarding the fist law may we ask the bsp uh what's the take up for the fist law uh how many uh bad assets or have been uh, have been uh, offloaded from the books of the banks Could we have data on that, Mr. Chair? Yes. Good morning, Senator Angal. Uh, the number of received master list application by the BSP uh, currently increased to 15 banks as of 18 August 2022 from the 14 banks that applied as of 19 July 2022. So in terms of the uh, ML, it is a requirement before a bank can actually apply for the issuance of certificate of eligibility or COE. Of these 15 banks, uh, uh, they were, there were seven banks that were issued final uh, master list applications. And then in addition, there were actually four COEs or certificate of eligibilities were issued uh, in, as of 17 August 2022. But the uh -huh. amount of take up yeah. in terms of uh, uh, the non-performing loans, uh, uh, this remained trivial as of the latest data, as of December 2021. Yeah. Uh, we'll provide pots, but it remains trivial as of end December 2021. We're still compiling pot for the stats. That's just a ballpark uh, figure, uh, Mr. Chair. And I, whether it's trivial or not, I think <laughs> we, just, we just want, is it a billion, two billion, three billion, ten billion? Uh, we'll provide pot. Well. Okay, sige, sige. You don't have it right now. Yes, but Senator Angara will provide. Uh, okay. We'll just uh, get okay, it. I'll from just wait for that. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, 
Can I ask uh, just just the uh, in general? How about the REIT law? How much uh, that's there's been late uh, implementation of that law? No, we passed that. I was still a congressman, uh, but lately there's been a lot of uh, sales of REITs. I think so. What's the status of that? Uh, has has anyone been monitoring that? Uh, Mr. Uh, Senator, it's uh, Kelvin uh, from the SEC. I, I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, but I can tell you that there there have been there has been substantial uptake of the rates precisely because of the changes that were made jointly under the former Secretary uh, of Finance uh, with the SEC, the DOF, the BIR. You know, back in uh, I think that was back in 2019, 2020. So from there. Uh, with the changes in the REIT IRR, uh, there was substantial uptake. Now we've had like, I think three or four a year, roughly. I, I just don't have the figures in front of me, Mr. Senator, I apologize. I'll, I will get the figures to you uh, in a moment. Now. Let me just get it. But, uh, I, I will just, just, uh, just a submission would suffice. Thank you, Elvin. Salamat, salamat. Just, uh, and then next is the, the PERA law, which is similar to the REIT. It was passed about a year apart from the REIT. We were, I was still in the House of Representatives. Wondering if the, but I remember, Around 2017, it was relaunched by, there was a ceremony at the DOF. And uh, I think, the, again, there was also a review of the the tax regime, no? That's because that was the, like the read, it was the sticky point. So uh, has there been take up uh, of, of the PERA law? Because that of PERA law, the personal uh, equity retirement account, uh, was conceptualized as a complement to existing social security. And now social security is becoming an issue. Uh, the president mentioned the uh, military and uniform pensions in his sauna, um, SSS, GSIS. There's there's a lot of there's some cases of fraud there. So uh, these were the the, the parallel was con conceptualized as kind of a complement uh, or even a substitute for that. Although um, many complained that the tax uh, benefits were not generous enough, but it would, it would not have passed if we uh, went for a hundred percent deductibility. But we'd we'd like to inquire if. Uh, we have figures on that of, of a take up uh, in the banks, etc. Yeah, we will get the figure for that, Mr. Chair. Uh, any, anything from the, the, the bankers? Uh, is there any, maybe just anecdotal, if, even if the figures are not there, is, is there a big take up? Similar to what. Uh, uh, the SEC mentioned about REITs that maybe they're three or four a year. Do we have any any at, uh, at least anecdotal evidence regarding pair accounts, Mr. Chair? We will get we'll get the figure, Mr. Chair. Okay. We Who's just speaking? Don't have it right yeah. Now. Can I? Uh, yeah, uh, Attorney Capulli of the Banco Central, Mr. Chair. Ah, sige, sige, Attorney. We'll just uh, wait for that one. <laughs> okay, so I'll just, uh, I'm, I'm in wrapping up, I just want to ask about financial inclusion because I know that's been an advocacy of the BSP and uh, other institutions. So how are we doing in terms of deposits, in terms of lending to uh, smaller borrowers? Do we have figures on that? Senator Angara, this is Richie from the Banco Central. Uh, let me first uh, answer to get back to the quest, the first questions on the uh, latest take up for the FIST, for the FIST okay. Act. Uh, okay. Based on latest data as of end December 2021, the amount availed by a universal uh, bank uh, approved COE as around 113 million. This is compared to the total loans of that particular bank of as around 18 billion total. Okay. Uh, the bill meant for under the fees is around 113 million. This is trivial when compared to the total loans of that said bank, uh, which stood at around 17 to 18 million. So only one, said. only one bank has. Uh, that's you're referring to just one bank. Only uh, one bank has availed of the fees. As of end December 2021, the amount of uh, availments with approved certificate of eligibility uh, is still one bank. So there are pending applications. Yes, there are pending applications. Okay. 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 Well, can you just give us updates? Uh, uh, maybe. Uh, if the yes, Senator. Changes, will no? Yeah. Yeah. Is it going to change significantly? 
uh, we expect some submission. Uh, we're still validating data po as of this uh, report. Okay, Thank thanks. Could I get an answer, Mr. Chair, on the financial inclusion question, please? Uh, please uh, uh, respond to Senator Angara's uh, request. Uh, uh, this is Mel from BSP, Senator Angara. We'll just provide the data. We have, an, we have a financial inclusion dashboard in the BSP website, but we can get the data. Could you, could you give me data over time? Because uh, ba, I say that that's really the test eh? if, of, of all our uh, initiatives and uh, laws and advocacies, whether we have become more financially inclusive. Maybe yeah. over the last 10, 15 years, if possible. Yeah. Yeah, yes, sir. The data suggests that somehow financial inclusion is improving, but again, we will provide you What the... does your data measure? I, I'd like to know beforehand, before you submit it, what are you submitting? Um, access, I mean, uh, number of accounts, and even the, the transactions. Uh, I mean, we also measure le relative to the, let's say, the digital payment transformation roadmap of the BSP, which aims to... Uh, which aims to convert 50% uh, of payment to retail and that 70% of Filipinos should have access to financial accounts by 2023. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about for lending? Do you have uh, any uh, in indexes there, in indices for uh, lending to MSMEs, for example? We will, uh, I'm sure we have, but uh, we will get uh, the, the data from our financial inclusion dashboard, Mr. Chair. Yes, I think that's very important, Mr. Chair. No? Kasi, yun nga, ang, ang tingin sa stock market, sa banko, is that it's really just, these are just uh, tools of the rich, di ba? So, how do we change that perception, whether it's true or not? No? Uh, so, I think it's very important uh, that, that uh, we don't just check the growth of deposits, etc., but also the quality of that growth, Mr. Chair. So, yun lang, I'll await the submissions. Thank you. Thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Yes. Mr. Chair, uh, we have updates on the PERA. Uh, Deputy Director Richie will uh, give us the update. <clears throat> okay. Hello, Senator Angara. This is Richie again from uh, the Banco Central. An update from the uh, PERA statistics as of end December 2021. Uh, there are 4,382 Filipinos that have invested in PERA or in personal equity and retirement account. Mm -hmm. Total contribution of around 253 million. Mm -hmm. uh, employees made up around 70% of the total PERA contributors in 2021, followed by self-employed individuals and OFW who accounted for the remaining 15% and 14% respectively. This, compared with the previous year, the number of PERA contributors increased by 64%, while the value of contribution rose by 45% in 2021. So in terms of uh, the other question on uh, financial inclusion dashboard, so the account ownership almost doubled, doubled in two years, the highest growth date for the country from 2019 in 2019 uh, increased to 59% in 2021. And then only 2% of Filipinos were able to correctly and, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, huh. So in yeah, terms- yeah. So Can you slow down a little? Because uh, you went from PERA to financial inclusion. Hindi, your, your financial inclusion figures are not related to PERA. They're independent uh, of PERA. Yes, they are independent. Okay, so, okay. Just to be clear. Huh? Just to be clear. Okay. So jumping to the- uh, financial inclusion stats, so account ownership almost doubled in two years, the highest growth to date for the country uh, based on data in 2021 is around 59%. So this is uh, relatively higher than the 2019 figure, which was 29%. Uh, you're measuring account accounts to individuals, huh? not just several, like, like not just one person having several accounts. Yes, this one is account ownership, uh, Senator Angara. Okay, okay. So, so Pera, you, you said 4,800 accounts were open in the 2021. Tama ba? Covering uh, about 200 million. As of end of December 2021, there are around 4,382 Filipinos invested 4, in Pera. Or, uh, okay, okay. And the total contributions of that uh, stood at 253 million. 
Do you have any data whether they keep the money or they withdraw it? Wala, walang may, may kasi may pre-termination yun, di ba? If you pre-terminate it, you don't avail of the tax benefits. Right I'm now, what we have, if you have data on that, yeah. Yes, your uh, yes, your honor. What right now, what we have is the outstanding or the total contribution that we uh, solicited or uh, gathered from the data, as well as the number of uh, accounts that have invested in Pera. Sige. If you can drill down on any other data, I would appreciate it very much. No? Not necessarily at this point, but uh, in the future, I realize you may have to retrieve it to, from okay. the institutions. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank Senator you. Angaram, uh, another uh, follow-up for the MSME loans. You inquired a while ago as to how yeah, yes, much, yes. Uh, the banks actually granted or extended uh, loans to the MSME sector. So as of end June 2022, uh, the banking system uh, extended uh, loans to the MSME sector uh, at around 447 billion. Uh, in terms of the new MSE, MSME loans extended by Universal and Commercial Bank for the month of May alone, uh, this stood at around 32.7 billion. How does it compare to previous years? So from previous year, uh, the new loans actually uh, uh, slightly increased from the 31.2 billion recorded from the same period a year ago. And in terms of the total loans extended as of end June 2022 to MSME, it actually slightly uh, uh, declined to 450 billion from last year's 460 billion. Uh... Yeah, why is that the case? You, wouldn't you expect it to go up in a bad time? Or it's because of interest rates going up? Normally, the demand as well as uh, the market expectations as well as uh, the inflationary uh, pressures and the cost of operating. So normally, the uh, demand from the these sectors would uh, jump or uh, move depending on the market conditions, Senator. Yeah. Uh, could you track that? Uh, I'll just ask for you to submit the data for the loans to MSMEs going back 10 okay. to 15 years, if possible, Mr. Chair. 10 to 15. Uh, we'll provide uh, Mr. Sir, Senator Angara. Yeah. Salamat po. Salamat po. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, we can now proceed with our initial hearing on the following measures referred to the committee. So Senate Bill Number 184, an act recognizing digital assets requiring the registration of digital asset enterprises the operators and other purposes by Senator Amy Marcos and uh, resolution uh, number 126, resolution directing the appropriate Senate committee to conduct an inquiry in aid of legislation on the status of regulations by the Banco Central ng Pilipinas and uh, other relevant government agencies concerning cryptocurrencies and other digital assets by yours truly. Uh, at this point, uh, of course, we've discussed a lot of these issues uh, already, but uh, if we would like to call on the representatives of the BSP to brief the committee on any other um, uh, any other uh, information that might be relevant on existing policies on cryptocurrency and virtual assets. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, Director Plabasan will make the presentation. Uh, good morning, everyone, Mr. Chair, and the rest of the members of the uh, House Committee. Uh, sorry, um, Senate Committee on Banks and Financial Institutions. Anyway, uh, uh, I had a very brief presentation about the virtual assets or cryptocurrencies and uh, the regulations surrounding this, uh, this uh, digital asset. So briefly, I will just cover an overview of the BA and BASPs. The ESPs are virtual asset service providers, so these are the entities involved in facilitating transactions related to virtual assets. What's the BSP's regulatory perimeter and uh, uh, what are our regulations and what are some of the policy reforms and other initiatives to strengthen surveillance and supervision of these uh, service providers? Next slide, please. So essentially, when we speak of virtual assets, generally it's any digitally stored units or values that can be traded or transferred. It can be used for payment, or if you wait for for its price, I mean, if you wait for uh, price swings, you can also use it for investment, for speculation. And generally, we do not, we no longer, most regulators no longer call them virtual currency because there's a legal and technical connotation for currency. We call them generally as virtual assets. 
because they're not backed by the government, they're privately issued. Next slide, please. And as far as the BSP is concerned, we don't regulate virtual assets per se, while there are close to 20,000 um, cryptocurrencies that are in circulation right now. What we regulate are the virtual asset service providers. So previously, again, as I mentioned back in 2017, when we issued the first framework on virtual currency exchanges, uh, we call them VCEs or virtual currency exchanges. Um, next, please. So right, right now, we, I mean, given the, the changes in, in the environment, in the landscape, so we had to uh, amend the existing regulation. And uh, that was, uh, the, a new regulation was, uh, the revised regulation was issued back in 2001, circa 1108. So which expanded the scope of the regulation and supervision of the ABSP to include other activities which are incidental or crucial in the performance of exchange between fiat and, and uh, virtual assets. So that includes now even uh, exchange between BAs or uh, transfer of BA and even safekeeping or custodian. Now, as mentioned earlier, uh, the SECs, uh, with respect to SECs regulatory perimeter, so, I mean, when it comes to virtual assets that, that are considered as security, so they fall within the pur purview of our Securities Regulations Act. That's why initial coin offering would fall within the, the, the purview of SEC. Next slide, please. Now, I, I, I am just, uh, this slide shows the BSPs. Uh, as you can see here, there are several activities which are regulated by the BSP. And, uh, uh, there are also different institutions performing these activities. So initially, consistent with the pronouncement of the Financial Action Task Force, um, virtual currency exchange was considered as a money service business. And based on the, on the new BSP, I mean, Central Bank Act, uh, MSB or money service business is within the purview of the BSP. Next, pli next slide, please. So when we speak of money service business, it actually entails several activities. Uh, I mentioned about e-money. I mentioned about the traditional remittance and uh, e-money, the likes of Gcash, Paymaya, Grab, etc. And of course, uh, again, included in the money service business is virtual asset service provider as, as defined in the new circular 1108. Next slide, please. So again, um, just showing here some of the pertinent regulations with respect to I mean, this this involves also this involves also electronic money. So the first e-money regulation was issued in two thousand and nine, which of course gave rise to the first one of the first mobile money in in the world. And now back in twenty uh, and, and sometime in twenty seventeen, we amended our rules on money service business. We also adopted one of the first regulatory framework on virtual currency exchange back in twenty seventeen through issue through the issuance of circular nine four four. And then the BSP's uh, charter was amended in 2019. And then we also saw some, some standards issued by FATF on virtual asset service provider. We adopted those uh, standards. And then we issued Circular 1108 in 2021. And another uh, set of standards are being is being issued by, by, by FATF. So we are studying the, the implication of those standards to our uh, existing regulations. Next slide, please. So when we speak of regulation, it also entails licensing. I mentioned about licensing process. So there's a very stringent licensing process for you to become both an EMI and a virtual asset service provider. So there has to be a presentation of the business model. Of course, we we before we endorse to SEC, we need to ensure first that they really are performing activities that are within the purview of the BSP. And then come the late, uh, I mean, the, the last stage really is the detailed evaluation of, and of course, it, it also entails systems walkthrough identifying or assessing yung security infrastructure, um, consumer protection mechanism, um, what else? Uh, uh, Cybersecurity, anti money laundering program, et cetera. All of these are being considered or evaluated before we issue uh, a license. Next slide, please. And here are some of the gaps, I can say gaps or challenges that we have identified. Of course, right now there's no explicit prohibition on foreign BSA, BASPs because when you, when you are offering 
products in the virtual world. Essentially, even those that are domiciled abroad can offer services here in the Philippines. And there are several, I mean, there are several approaches. I mean, FATF recognizes that some jurisdictions, depending on their risk appetite and depending on their resource, resources, may choose to ban them, may choose to ask them to regulate here in the Philippines or may choose to, let's say, rely on the regulation of that entity in other jurisdiction. So uh, when it comes to, again, in our case, what we did is we issued uh, several advisories already, and we, we, we asked the, the public to, to exercise caution when it comes to dealing with foreign-based BASPs and other uh, other service providers because essentially on the challenge not not there's I mean there are challenges associated with with uh, let's say legal recourse or with uh, respect to consumer protection so and unlike entities that are uh, registered with the BSP and SEC of course the BS you can get legal protection from the BSP and SEC as well and of course, one of the main challenges really, I mentioned, uh, I mean, um, Senator Gachalan mentioned about staying ahead of the curb. So there, I mean, the, we, when it comes to this space, really the, the business models are fast evolving. The products and services are also fast evolving. So there's really now a challenge as to, let's say, as to the applicability of the existing regulations to evolving products and services like NFTs, uh, stable coins, etc. But uh, on the last slide, I think that has been al addressed already in terms of the accounting treatment of virtual assets. It can be investment or inventory or intangible asset, depending on the purpose of the uh, uh, the entity holding those virtual assets. So what are some of the action items that we are currently undertaking? So in the BSP, again, uh, we regularly do re uh, regulatory benchmarking. We also bench we 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 not we benchmark our regulations with other regulatory authorities with with standard setting bodies. We are also in the process. We are also in the process of issuing a regulation on sandbox. So those entities can collaborate with the BSP with respect to some services which are not yet covered by existing regulations. Um, you mentioned about the use of technology. So we are also in the process of automating a lot of processes in the BSP. Even with respect to how we do supervision and surveillance, we are now in the process of uh, acquiring solutions um, in terms of, let's say, we have one on, on, on cybersecurity. We are also planning to acquire a blockchain analytics solution to, um, to strengthen our surveillance over virtual asset service providers. And of course, we also need to strengthen our collaborative engagement with other uh, regulatory authorities like the SEC, uh, Insurance Commission, etc. Because there are also um, we can also learn from from their experience, and we can also share the experience of the BSP when it comes to, let's say, regulating uh, fintech-related products and services. That ends my very brief presentation, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, um, I'd like to ask if there's, a, I know we have representatives from the private sector, if any of them would like to comment briefly on the, the subject. Mr. Chair? Yes, please proceed. Mr. Chair, uh, this is Lito Villanueva, uh, Chairman of the FinTech Alliance, the PH. Uh, uh, of course, uh, to uh, uh, Committee Chair uh, Mark Villar, other members of the committee, honorable senators, for speakers, uh, good afternoon. Uh, the Fintech Alliance, the PH, the Philippines Prime Trade Organization for Digital Finance and Fintech Startups and Unicorns, that collectively generate over 90% of digital transaction volume in the country today, supports the Senate Bill 184 and Senate Resolution 126. As a strategic partner of our regulators, the Banco Central and Filipinas, and the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Fintech Alliance continuously engages them in constructive dialogue to further promote enabling regulations to further support innovations for financial inclusion. The Alliance supports risk-based regulatory regime, putting consumer protection at the core, one of which is providing for mechanisms aimed at registration and regulations of emerging technologies such as digital assets. Among our ASEAN neighbors, Thailand has been aggressive in boosting decentralized virtual currencies. It recently approved four new digital asset companies and of course, unlike China and India, which declared a crackdown on crypto, 
we are seeing other markets or jurisdictions embracing digital assets, given that most of their citizens are already transacting through various digital assets platforms worldwide. While Cambodia was the first in the ASEAN to roll out its retail central bank digital currency, or known as the Project Baco, other markets such as the Philippines, Vietnam, and Indonesia are also likely to do their respective pilots. But given retail investors' recent losses in the digital assets market, tighter regulation is inevitable. The inherent problem with cryptocurrency itself uh, should not be ignored. Crypto remains unusually volatile as an asset class, and due to its decentralized nature, a lack of comprehensive regulation and the non-transparent qualities of many crypto firms, it is much riskier for investors than equities, bonds, gold, or traditional assets. For us here in the Philippines, we look forward to having risk-based regulations without stifling innovations for inclusion. There must be more clarity on the rules of engagement for emerging technologies such as digital assets, uh, NFTs, and the like. The SEC may implement stricter qualifications for the management and licensing of digital assets exchanges with the goal of better protecting retail investors and promoting massive consumer education. That's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are, are there any other comments? Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to make a comment. Proceed. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Senator Marcos, Senator Gachalan, Senator Angara, Senator Pimentel, SEC Chairman Aquino, DS, uh, BSB uh, Deputy Governor Fonanchier, and other uh, honorable mentions of the committee today. Thank you for inviting us to be part of the hearing. Um, I'm joined by myself and APEC Director Lian Fong. We are representing CZ, uh, the CEO and founder of Binance.com, who unfortunately, due to prior commitments in Germany, cannot attend today's uh, hearing. He sends his deepest regrets, um, but he will be updated on today's discussion. I'd like to take this opportunity to briefly introduce our company, Binance. We are fortunate to be the leading blockchain company globally, and we embrace the responsibility to lead the industry from the front, support regulators, and seek to establish global regulatory framework for the industry and help drive mainstream adoption to crypto as it is essential for the growth in the industry. Our primary objectives are providing safe, trustworthy, fully compliant ecosystems to allow users to trade crypto assets in a transparent, safe manner, growing and maintaining sustainable user base through positive user experience, through technology and exceeding expectations, and best practices of compliance through code of conduct, robust policies, procedures, high technology tools, and qualified compliance professionals. We strongly believe that the crypto industry can greatly benefit the Filipino people through addressing the necessity of financial inclusion through digitalization. Over 78% of Filipinos remain unbanked, but crypto has de but crypto can decrease that number as the crypto asset holders will soon surpass the number of credit card holders in the Philippines. It is stated from the Philippine Star that there was a 362% increase on in uh, crypto transactions in the first half of 2021. These transactions were worth over 106 billion pesos. With local crypto rising, there is a, um, a great need for regulation, with Philippines ranking fifth worldwide in terms of ownership and 28% of adults saying they own cryptocurrency in the Philippines. I myself am a Filipino. My wife is a Filipino. My daughter was born here and she will grow up here. And I predict by the time she uh, has her first car, she'll probably already have digital assets. So there is a need to monitor cryptocurrency for illicit activities, legislative action to protect and educate users like my daughter. Our experience working with regulators in other countries, it is important to focus on a few key elements. AML, KYC, consumer protection, creating checks and, uh, checks and processes, um, and working with global experts in creating education to the public to involve them in risks of crypto assets. Consumer protection is critical for Binance. We have uh, published clear terms of use and risk warnings, which we carry out due to, uh, extensive due diligence on digital assets before listing to ensure quality standard. To illustrate this robustness, Binance has received around 450 applications and only five of these projects were listed. The statistics is similar for direct listings where only 1% of tokens are listed on the Binance platform. We are not a law enforcement entity, but we look forward to increased partnerships with key agencies to, that can formally handle these matters. For example, we are already in contact with Director McSaisai of the CICC to conduct formal training for government officials to better understand crypto agencies um, and uh, secured cybersecurities. 
Binance also recently de uh, delivered workshops for law enforcement agencies and banking professionals in Germany, Canada, Italy, Paraguay, Brazil, to help facilitate investigations of cyber crimes. And we also have the world's largest insurance fund called SAFU, which is, uh, stands for Secure Asset Fund for Users, holding over $1 billion that could be used to pay out users should their accounts be hacked. Binance has a zero tolerance policy for KYC um, that, that, uh, that um, involves double registration, anonymous identities, uh, obscure source of funds, um, and, the pro and the KYC process are compliant with AML, CFT rules in over 200 jurisdictions worldwide. Binance does not allow users to trade on a platform without passing KYC, including country of residence, identification of information, and we are happy to integrate this with local eKYC players. Over the last 18 months, it has been our primary objective to establish and assemble the best security and compliance team consisting of more than 500 people across the globe. And because of this, Binance was able to secure approvals and registration from France, Italy, Spain, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Bahrain, making us one of the few companies in the world to secure regulatory approval from G7 countries. Education is a major pillar for Binance, and we offer free crypto literacy, crypto literacy courses through Binance Academy. We have over 450 blockchain articles and videos in 25 languages, and we have already uh, opened up conversations with local Philippine universities to offer free college courses and professional certificates in blockchain technology, cryptocurrency, Web3 trading, Meta, and DeFi. Secondly, our experience working with regulators in other countries say that it's important to have a central regulator, such as existing framework currently in place, which allows more visibility in capturing nature and flow of fiat to e-money, and then cryptocurrencies with other digital assets and vice versa. We support both BSP and the SEC as they aim to add clarity and transparency over digital assets. Having a streamlined approach to financial services, expanding into transactions involving cryptocurrencies and digital assets will decrease the risk of conflicting and redundant compliance processes. It will give better oversight to monitoring illicit activities, and we aim to support the regulators to increase efficiencies when considering capacity building, which takes time and effort to create new teams and expand offices. Our last suggestion, Your Honor, is that the IRR be parallel efforts with the bill, as our position is best made on actual regulation rather than a spirit of uh, spirit of legislation which is prone to carrying interpretations again thank you mr chairman honorable committee members for your time this morning um, if i may i'll pass it on to leon for a brief comment as well yes uh, please uh, thank you and uh, uh, please uh, keep your uh, comments brief thank you Sorry, unfortunately, there's no sound. Uh, is there, a... uh, Mr. Uh, sir? Uh, I, I think uh, your sound's not. Uh... Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. I think I will keep this brief. I think it's, I just want to serve as a reminder that with any regulatory framework, it's important to keep in consideration the key three objectives. I think the first one is being market integrity which is why risk control measures and AML and CFT procedures cannot be compromised. And this is something that we'll love to work closely uh, with the local regulators on. The second piece is investor and consumer protection. While many of that involves around controls and risk management and risk-based assessments, I think a key part to user protection is also education. And I think this, this is the piece where the private sector can actually work very closely with the key regulators from both the SEC as well as the BSP to really drive proliferation in terms of understanding of new virtual asset classes. And I think the third piece, which is often understated, is also market development. I think this is where we'd love to be able to commend, you know, the SEC on really building a very kind of active uh, PDEX market and digital exchange market for, for securities. As mentioned earlier, I think today the total market cap stands at above $16.3 trillion. And we believe that the virtual assets can also contribute to further market development when it comes to the growth of virtual assets in the Philippines. So I think with these three things in place, I think I'd like to just point towards what we see as the key components of digital asset regulations. The first piece being the fiat to virtual asset component and the virtual asset to fiat. 
Without the fiat components, it's impossible for market development to take place. The second piece being a lot harder to regulate and a lot harder to differentiate between decentralized exchanges and centralized exchanges is the virtual asset to virtual asset trading portion. With that, I think the key focus should be on surveillance, AML, and CFT measures. And then the third piece being custody, where you know, ranging from new fintech as well, uh, companies as well as traditional financial institutions and banks might want to start offering custody services for these new asset classes. With that, cybersecurity, asset protection, understanding of things like multi-threshold, multi-party computation when it comes to securing co-wallets will be really key in terms of driving the future of regulations. So while keeping it brief, we would love to be able to continue this conversation with the various associations as well as the regulators to understand how we can take this to the next step. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Any, is there any other comments uh, from... Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. This is uh, Attorney Mike David from CEJA. Yes, please keep it brief. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, our resource speakers, and members from the private uh, uh, industry. Uh, just a brief comment about this. And uh, from coming from CEJA, which uh, we are currently regulating offshore uh, companies who are conducting in the same line of business as we're discussing now. Uh, we, we totally agree with what uh, with FinTech Alliance PH have mentioned and what uh, Binance have mentioned and how we can approach the problem. Um, in, the, in our case, just to show maybe some steps of what uh, the CESAs have, have been doing and what is it is doing right now, we're currently revamping our own regulations and now gearing towards establishing a stronger self-regulating uh, organization or an SRO to help out these uh, new industries, these new companies coming in and uh, which uh, right now we're also working with other private uh, sec uh, with other private companies that could really help us see the industry and the regulations in its current state and how we could move forward. And I think uh, as what uh, Binance have mentioned and what our friends from Fintech Alliance PA have mentioned that a good way to do it is through a sandbox approach. And I think that's what is what SEC is also currently doing. And uh, perhaps we can develop a further, uh, you know, a, a more of a coordination between government and private agencies so we can come up with these regulations uh, as soon as we can because we see that these things are coming up and the Philippines becoming a good host for this industry and uh, with the pool of talents and users that we have, it will be very timely for us. So uh, as from CESA, we're seeing that we're ready to do it as we've been doing it for the past few years as well. Uh, that's it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, and it's very uh, enlightening to hear from the private sector, and I look forward to more uh, discussions in the future. Uh, at this point, are there any other questions from the members of the committee? There being none, um, I'm looking for, we are looking forward to more hearings and discussions in this matter, and we, in the future, we will call for uh, future meetings to discuss these uh, bills and also technical working group meetings. So uh, the committee will uh, inform uh, when this uh, will send notices as to the time and venue. And uh, at this point, uh, should there, we, we'd like to, uh, we're entertaining any motions from the committee. Move to adjourn, Mr. Chair. Uh, there's a move to adjourn. Uh, I already moved to Journey. Uh, so, um, uh, move to suspend the session. Uh, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm withdrawing my motion, and uh, instead, I move to suspend session. There is a motion to suspend. Uh, any objections? There being none, uh, the motion is carried. This uh, this um, this committee hearing is hereby suspended. And I'd also, I'd also like to uh, thank everyone. Uh, I'd like to express my gratitude to all, all the stakeholders here, my colleagues in the Senate, uh, from the agencies, our experts, and of course the private sector for attending this meeting. And I look forward to uh, future meetings and a very productive uh, sessions. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon. Set up in Canada.